Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to Behind the Mask for Negroes Part 1. And this very important notice that it is never our intention to offend anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. The goal of this video is for you to look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications referenced and study them yourself. Remember, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our own minds. Marcus Garvey And from Katha G. Woodson, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. So, when you hear words in Africa, do you wonder what they could be fighting over? Do you try to compare the cost of the weapons and the hunger they tell you exists in Africa? Do you wonder who trains the fighters on weapons used? Do you wonder how the commanders get followers? Do you wonder if the people fighting are the same people? Do you wonder how the weapons they use get to them? Do you wonder where the adverts for the weapons were placed? Do you wonder how supposedly illiterates, hungry and stupid, have access to top grade military weapons? These are our simple questions to you. Remember, you may never have wondered if everyone in Africa is so stupid that they are always fighting and at the same time complaining of being hungry. So when you hear hunger in Africa, do you wonder if the words cause the hunger or the hunger causes the words? Do you wonder where the fighters get their own food from? Do you wonder if both sides are the same or different? Do you wonder if the fighters have families and relations and where they would be during those wars? Now remember, for every fighter there is a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a wife or perhaps a baby as the case may be. Do you just wonder where those people would be when these people are waging their fights? And do you wonder what happens when they are called to order or when they are called to reason? Why they just don't agree or never agree? Do you just believe that everyone in Africa is that stupid? That's our simple question again to you. When you hear hunger in Africa and you are given an envelope to donate to charity for starving African children, what comes to your mind? Why the weapons maker does not donate enough to feed them? Or how the money gets to the victims of the war? Or why you were given the same envelopes before the war? Remember. There is always an envelope for starving African children, apparently since you were born. Have you ever wondered how these people never get to a point of feeding themselves at least and stop begging you or disturbing you for whatever reason? Then sometimes you ask why the so-called superpowers of this world cannot stop the war? Then you are told the country is independent. Why does the lame duck UN not step in, you ask? Then you are told that it's an internal affair. And before we delve into our topic of today, we are going to have a slight detour from our usual tradition of referencing materials published ideally before 1950. Let us reference The Green Book by Mama Al Gaddafi, published 1975, and there we see the following. All political systems in the world today are a product of the struggle for power between alternative instruments of government. This struggle may be peaceful or armed, as is evidenced among classes, sects, tribes, parties or individuals. The outcome is always the victory of a particular governing structure, be it that of an individual, group, party or class and the defeat of the people the defeat of genuine democracy note that very important point the defeat of genuine democracy and it goes further to tell us that wage earners however improved their wages may be are a type of slave wage earners are but slaves to the masters who hire them they are temporary slaves 
and their slavery lasts as long as they work for wages from employers, be they individuals or the state. The worker's relationship to the owner or the productive establishment and to their own interests is similar under all prevailing conditions in the world today, regardless of whether ownership is right or left. Even publicly owned establishments give workers wages as well as other social benefits similar to the charity endured by the rich owners of economic establishments upon those who work for them. And then he goes further to tell us that domestic servants, paid or unpaid, are a type of slave. Indeed, they are the slaves of the modern age. Since the new socialist society is based on partnership and not on a wage system, natural socialist rules do not apply to domestic servants because they render services rather than production. Note this very well. Services have no tangible material product and cannot be divided into shares according to the natural socialist rule. Domestic servants have no alternative but to work for wages or even be unpaid in the worst of situations as wage earners are a type of slave and their slavery exists as long as they work for wages. Domestic servants whose position is lower than that of wage earners in economic establishments and corporations have an even greater need to be emancipated from the society of wage labor and the society of slaves. Domestic servants is a phenomenon that comes next to slavery. We want you to take very good note of these points. They tell us the position of the Negro today and the Negro might do himself or herself a favor by asking how many products or Negro products are consumed by anybody in the world today. This is an important question before we go into our topic of today. Behind the mask, let us reference a tropical dependency, an outline of the ancient history of the Western Sudan with an account of the modern settlement of Northern Nigeria by Flora L. Shaw. Lady Lugard and it was published 1905 and there we see the following. The Fulani who counted themselves a white race were constantly subject to black rulers and it is related of the black women of one of the kingdoms of the Sudan that when their monarch was overthrown by a contemporary Baba king, they too proud to allow themselves to fall into the hands of white men preferred to commit suicide. So we want you to take very good note of this and ask yourself when it became the tradition for black people to commit suicide because white people were ruling over them. Take note of this important point very well because we want to show you or ask you who is behind the mask. Note what we have just read very very well please. Let us reference the history of slavery and the slave trade, ancient and modern, the African slave trade and political history of slavery in the United States by W. O. Blake and it was published in 1858 and there we see the following. When the Negroes see that their resistance is no longer of any avail, they frequently prefer death to slavery and if they are not prevented, you may see the father rip up first the stomach of his wife, then of his children, and then his own, that they may not fall alive into the hands of the enemy. That's our interest, but we'll read a bit further down so you can get the context. Others endeavor to save themselves by creeping into holes and remain there for several days without nourishment where there is frequently only room sufficient to allow them to lie on their backs and in that situation they sometimes remain for eight days. They have assured me that if they can overcome the first three days, they may with a little effort continue full eight days without food. But even from these hiding places, the unfeeling barbarians know how to draw them or they make use of means to destroy them provided with combustibles such as peace, brimstone, etc. The soldiers try to kindle a fire before the entrance of the holes 
and by forcing the stinking smoke into them, the poor creatures are obliged to creep out and surrender themselves to their enemies or they are suffocated with the smoke. Now, we challenge you to find out who is behind the mask and the mask we mean is what is happening currently in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, comparatively, if you looked at the story we read earlier, remember the book we read, Tropical Dependence, was published in 1905. The one we just read was published in 1858. It becomes very clear that they just wanted to turn the thing on its head. They want to make it look like the Negroes committed suicide to avoid being ruled by white kings rather than they were committing suicide to run away from being captured and sold as slaves. Now remember by 1905, the slavery would have just ended by around 1901, which we can just show you so we can reduce the length of the video. Remember after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, the Negroes from Negro land and Guinea and Cape Negro in Angola area were still being exported to the New World as slaves. Even after the 1808 USA uh, hypocritical uh, stop of the slave trade by 1808, it continued export of slaves to the south of the US. So by 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation kicked in, they stopped technically from what was Negro land to export from exporting to the US, but they were still exporting to Europe, to Turkey and the Middle East. So you have to bear this in mind. So it stopped effectively around 1900. And this woman is writing by 1905. We want you to take very good note of this. Read the materials and try to see who is behind the mask. Our reason for citing these two materials is our foundation for this video. Let us also reference travels in the interior districts of Africa performed under the direction and patronage of the African Association in the years 1795, 1796, and 1797 by Mongo Park, Sojourn, and it was published 1799. Note this very well, 1799, and there we see the following. The Fullers of Bando are naturally of a mild and gentle disposition, but the uncharitable maxims of the Quran has made them less hospitable to strangers and more reserved in their behavior than the Mandingos. They evidently consider all the Negro natives as their inferiors and when talking of different nations always rank themselves among the white people. We want you to compare these three writings, one in 1799, the other in 1858, and the last one that said it was because the blacks didn't want to be under a white king was in 1905. So you see how revisionism and propaganda works. We'll show you what we mean further. So, and from the same book we referenced earlier, the same woman that is alleging that those people commit suicide in order not to be ruled by a white king or something along those lines, is writing here again. It says, The advent of the British and the overthrow of Fulani rule were at first held by the peasantry as an excuse to repudiate all obligations to pay taxes and even in the well-organized province of Kano, the revenue could not be collected. It was evident that if the policy of ruling through the Fulani was to be maintained, the first duty of the British administration was to provide for the peaceable collection of the taxes and since the conquered emirs had been deprived of the power to raise troops or police in their territories, it was necessary that British force should even be applied in case of need to compel payment. Again, we ask you, who is behind the mask? Let us reference The White Man in Nigeria by George Douglas Hazeldine and it was published 1904. And there we see the following. And reading from just above the highlighted portion, it says, Failure of tribute was the inevitable result and punitive expeditions, tax gathering tolls, slave raids, slave raids pure and simple, call them what you will, began again. That's the Fulani. Then again, every woman about to become a mother went and hid in the bush like a wild beast until the baby was old enough 
not to be a fatal encumbrance in case of a hasty flight. Then, again, the rumor that the Fulani were coming emptied great villages and scattered the people over the face of the earth. Then again, the old and the feeble were put to the sword. Then again, children became scarce. The fields lay idle and the land flowed with blood. It was to save the country from this that Great Britain stepped in. And here again we ask you, who is behind the mask? That's our simple question for you. And here it tells us that Musa knew a lot about slavery. One day when he overheard one of the punker boys who had been judiciously whipped for stealing 18 of lard out of the storeroom, holding forth to the other household servants on the cruelty of the white man in general and the hardships of government work service in particular. He walked into the group and catching the fat youth by the ear said, you be one big fool, you. If the white man no come, you be slave and carry brick for the Fulani all day. You know savvy that, you be one big fool. And again we ask you, who is behind the mask? And going back to the book Tropical Dependency we referenced earlier, we see where it tells us that the names quoted by Hercules are evidently names to be respected. Yet the account given by Hawkins himself of his methods in a subsequent expedition of 1567 differs in nothing from the accounts given by eyewitnesses of Arab slave raids of the present day. He not only traded, he raided. There came to us, he says, a negro sent from a king oppressed by other kings, his neighbors desiring our side with promise that as many negroes as by these wars might be obtained as well of his part as of ours should be at our pleasure. Now imagine a negro king coming to them with 600 slaves. Does it make sense to you? Is it possible to you? Note this very well because the slave master is a heartless capitalist. Do you believe he can go down there with a ship and come down with only 10 or 20 slaves? If not, could you tell us how you think one negro king could bring 600 or 700 slaves to fill a slave ship, no matter how many they are? So that's what we want you to try and answer and again we ask you, do you know who is behind the mask? So it goes further to tell us that as a result, I went myself and with the help of the king of our side, assaulted the town both by land and sea and very hardly with fire their houses being covered with dry palm leaves, obtained the town and put the inhabitants to flight, where we took 250 persons, men, women and children, but they are giving you the impression that they bought them. You see that they set the houses on fire, captured 250 people, but they are telling you that they were sold to them. Now, remember, that's the origin of your prison system. If you doubt what we're saying, investigate. So it goes further to say, and by our friend, the king of our side, there were taken 600 prisoners, whereof we hoped to have had our choice. But the Negro, in bracket, in which nation is seldom or never found truth, meant nothing less. The Negro king decamped in the night with his prisoners, and Hawkins was left with the few which we had gotten ourselves. It is interesting to observe in Hawkins' letters describing these and other expeditions the perfect reliance of the mariners upon the Almighty to be on their side and to bring them out of all their dangers with good store of Negroes for sale. Remember, these are the slave masters of the British here telling you of selling <laughs> the Negroes but they told you they bought them. You have seen how they acquired them. That's why we are asking you this question, who is behind the mask? Before this video finishes, if you have not gotten where it's going already, the question still remains, who do you think is behind the mask? Just for context, let us see what it tells us about how they, are, they rely on the Almighty. It says, on one occasion they were becalmed for 18 days and in great danger of death from starvation 
having so great a company of Negroes on board, but Almighty God, who never suffered his elect to perish, sent, we are told, a special wind to carry the slave raiders safe to their destination, and when they reached it, they obtained license to sell their cargo on the ground that their vessel was a ship of the Queen's Majesty of England, and that the cargo of pertained to our Queen's Highness. Church and state watched over their oppressions and they walked in an order of the highest sanctity. And then we ask you again, who is behind the mask? So another information of interest goes down to say another famous English seller, Drake, who as a young man accompanied Hawkins on one of his earlier expeditions to the coast, was more humane or more fastidious in his place than his great leader. For after one experience, he never again went slave raiding. But some days you will hear some so-called African Americans today tell you that no European stepped foot. It was done by Africans. The same Africans that they were told had no guns, were living on trees, and were naked. Again, we ask you, who is behind the mask? If you can read between the lines, you would have started knowing who is behind the mask. And further here, it tells us that it may be remembered that one of the most valued privileges considered to Great Britain at the Peace of Utrecht in 1712 was the Asiento contract, or the right to supply the Spanish colonies on the American coast with slaves. And that's our interest for the so-called African Americans who are buying into the false narrative that they are aborigines or whatever they are now deceiving them with go and read this material yourself and then we ask you again who is behind the mask and further reading from within the highlighted portion it says the inhabitants of Biafra further east were very gross pagans of a wild temper and made human sacrifices to the devil remember you have to know who the devil is before you can make sacrifices to it or to him. Likewise, you will know who God is in order to make sacrifices to him. Maybe you can tell us how they knew who the Negroes or the pagans were sacrificing to at that time. And remember, it was the same thing that protected them until they were deceived out of it. So the question becomes, who were they really making sacrifices to? The devil or to the Almighty? Now, we refer you to the book in Leviticus. Just read all of it. You would have started understanding who is behind the mask. Then he goes further to say, Inland from New Calabar and the Cross River, the natives were cannibals. And southwards from this district, the country was inhabited by very low-class naked natives to Gabon, where the inhabitants, very savage and animal in their habits, were barbarous, wild, bloody and treacherous. These were the most wretchedly poor and miserable of any in Guinea. They were excessively fond of brandy and married indifferently any female members of their family, including their mothers. Now we ask you again, do you think the slave master will just go and capture a cannibal and put in his house? Now notice how the slave master came up with all his propaganda against the Negroes. Now, if you also believe that the slave master could have gone to capture people that had nothing to offer, then therein lies your gullibility. Here again, we ask you, who is behind the mask? Let us reference The Gold Coast, Past and Present by George MacDonald and it was published in 1898 and there we see the following. That part of the Guinea territory known as the Slave Coast extended in early times from the Volta River in the Gold Coast eastward to Biafra and included in its area the now well-known countries of Togo, Dahomey, Lagos, Yoruba and Benin and formed together with Ashanti, one of the three great slave producing parts of the African continent. In these early times Ashanti, Dahomey, Yoruba and Benin we are among the most powerful states to be found in this part of Africa. Ruled by savage despots and maintaining what might be termed large standing armies 
well armed and disciplined in their own native fashion and used for raids and forays upon their weaker neighbors. They supplied the European adventurers who visited the coast for this purpose with their cargoes of black ivory in exchange for those commodities most tempting to these wily savages. So again, you will understand why the Yoruba press is always on the side of the Fulani because they all did the slave trade together. We ask you again, who is behind the mask? Now remember, no matter how you look at it, you will see that the Yoruba is well aligned with the Fulani and it's not everyone in the southwest of Nigeria today is Yoruba. The Igbas are not Yorubas. But our challenge to you is to conduct your own research and find out who is behind the mask. You will find out why the likes of Trump and Theresa May do not ever mention Biafra because they know the implication. They know what they are doing. Their foot soldiers are people that lack the most basic of common sense and humanity. And that's exactly what is going on. So here you see the map of the Gold Coast at that time. Now remember very well that the Ghana you see today was formerly the Gold Coast. They just renamed it Ghana and it has nothing to do whatsoever with the ancient kingdom of Ghana. They just renamed it. Very simple. So you bear that in mind. So the Gold Coast is the map you see right on your screen. The Ashantis were the Afil soldiers there. The Yorubas at the Fulanis. The Fulanis were the Arabs where they are foot soldiers down further down on the west coast of Africa. So you understand why the Yoruba media, the Yoruba churches all walk with the Islamic Caliphate in Sokoto. So you don't think they are for you because you attend the same church with them. That's not correct. Now the Negroes are not the same as the Negroids. Again we ask you, who is behind the mask? Let us reference the story of Africa and its explorers by Robert Brown, M.A. Ph.D., Volume 1, and it was published 1891, and there we see the following. And reading from just above the highlighted portion, it says, Most of the towns were well fortified. Considering the force likely to be brought against them, the reason was that the Fulas, that's the Fulanese, were a warlike people capable of placing 16,000 men in the field and prone to hostilities against their neighbors since they could not obtain European goods without slaves nor slaves without making war. However, only the young and strong were taken. The old and feeble to avoid trouble had their throats cut. But they excused themselves for this barbarity by declaring that the people whom they thus raided, robbed and murdered never pray to God, and that as the European factories would sell guns, powder, and cloth for no other articles except black men and women, the people whom the travelers tried to persuade into more peaceful pursuits had no alternative. Moreover, did not the book, in bracket the Quran, enjoin on the faithful to make war against the infidel? So you see what we're talking about? Remember, our interest here is where he says they could not obtain European goods without slaves, nor slaves without making war. So we ask you again, who is behind the mask? Let us reference the Sudan by H. Cow W. Kim, PhD, and it was published in 1907. And there we see the following. A picture showing the interior of the Emir of Kano's house, that is the palace of the Emir of Kano. This is the interior as at 1907. Now remember the book we referenced earlier showed us that they could not get European goods without slaves and could not get slaves without making wars. So now you see what the entrance of the palace looks like and what the palace looks like below it. So now today look at what that palace looks like. This is the front of that palace today and you can see a Rolls Royce parked in front of it. Now we ask you who is behind the mask. And here is another Rolls Royce of that same emirate. Remember the emir is a Fulani. You need to understand it 
and these Rolls Royces are not serviced in Nigeria they are actually serviced in the UK so now you would have started understanding who is behind the mask and why no matter what you do no matter how many Biafrans or Ambazonians they massacre in that region there is no United Nations there is no ECOWAS there is no AU or there is no any nonsense or Amnesty International to talk about it Trump will not talk neither will Theresa May now would you you would have started seeing who is behind the mask so here you see the ex king of Kano and then you see a slave on your right and then we see next and from the same book here it says I count 17 villages in flames as I write I hear the loud wails on the left bank over those who are there slain ignorant of their many friends now in the depths of Lualaba oh let thy kingdom come no one will ever know the exact loss on this bright sultry summer morning it gave me the impression of being in hell thus comes the voice from the prince of missionaries in the south listen to another tale told by Denham and Clepperton on their journey from Tripoli to Lake Chad north of the Sudan travels and discoveries in northern and central Africa which you can reference yourself but he goes further to say during the last two days we had passed on average from 60 to 80 or 90 skeletons each day but the numbers that lay about the wells at El Hama were countless those of two women whose perfect and regular teeth bespoke them young were particularly shocking their arms still remained clasped round each other as they had expired although the flesh had long since perished by being exposed to the burning rays of the sun and the blackened bones only left now that is what some people come to deny that the slave trade didn't happen again we ask you who is behind the mask and here you see some freed slaves now remember when the slave trade en ended they still had some slaves in their dungeons they still had some people ready to be shipped the slave master would normally come there to negotiate sales the same way they go there for oil today now remember the oil is in the south they come to the north to take it that's exactly what they do so their agreement appears to be weapons in return for these resources so when anyone speaks you will see them mother whoever speaks now you will be thinking that oh it's the same black people killing themselves the Fulanis are not Negroes and therein lies the problem you might not understand this unless you go and read and you can see what they are doing in sub-saharan Africa today why not ask yourself normally in traditional Negro society if you were to offend anyone and run to the next person as in to surgeon or to find some protection even if it's a smaller child weaker it's incumbent on whoever is chasing you to leave you that's honor but when people from Ambazonia came to Nigeria do you know that because the Fulani controlled that whole sub-region they deported them back to Cameroon that should tell you now why not ask yourself is it possible that all black people can be as foolish the answer is no they are not the same people and therein lies the problem this is why no matter how many people they kill you will see that Trump, Theresa May all of those uh, European governments will turn the other way because their oil companies are there they know their agreement and they know that it is not the same people and again we ask you who is behind the mask so here you see how the British conquered the Fulanese at that time in order to stop the slave trade now remember you are told that the British stopped the slave trade but you were never told how and you were never told what roles they played again we ask you who is behind the mask but here you see where it says who conquered it Great Britain Sir Frederick Lugard proclaimed to Sokoto and Kano the new reign of peace and freedom the end of slave raiding, bribery, corruption, mutilation, poisoning and such like Fulani tactics. The new kingdom of righteousness which hung upon the promise from this time and forever white men and soldiers 
we sit down in the Sokoto country. Now remember, it was this same alliance they had when he told you that they were they needed slaves to get European goods. That's why we ask you who is behind the mask. If you notice, till today it is the same corruption that the Fulanese will tell you that they are fighting. Now you might think that they are actually fighting corruption because the place is actually corrupt. No. They are fighting corruption in the sense that it's only good when they do it. They can dip in the, their hands in the treasury, public funds, take it and give to anybody they like. That's not corruption. What their understanding of corruption is, is if they don't like you or if they think you are not supporting their subjugating or killing people, they will come and arrest you and accuse you of something. You probably have heard of people like Dezani that they accused of having 50 houses. All they will do is they go to the media and publish that the courts that you have forfeited 50 houses. No real houses or so 50 houses. You, they will, you will probably not get a court summon or anything. That's what the slave master taught them. Remember at that time they needed to stop the slave trade. But then they handed the place back to them when they were living. And that is where all the problems are till today. Wherever these people go, it's all violence and bloodshed. No kind of development. If you doubt what we're saying, go to the northern part of Nigeria and see what is going on there. Go to the middle belt and see what they are doing. Now they came up to say they want to build because they are very lawless. They want to build a Fulani settlement all over Nigeria. And that's because the slave master is hiding behind and they are working for the digital economy. Remember, bitcoins might be out soon and they will no longer be exchanging colored paper for oil. So they need to place them within every geographical space because these are people that lack both humanity and common sense. That's unfortunate, but that's the truth. They can kill any number of people. Just give them the weapons. That's all you need. If you doubt what we're saying, go and look at them. It is, if you notice, it is the BBC that provides the propaganda that tries to create an impression that they're just cattle dealers because it is the slave master hiding behind them which we challenge you to investigate, you don't need to believe us. We've never asked you on this channel to believe us. We've always told you to conduct your own research. Read between the lines, pay close attention to every detail. So you can pause the video and read about the Khan dungeon. Remember they had slave barracoons all over the place. Nigeria was not started as a country, it was a slave farm at that time. Believe it or not, you can investigate it yourself. And that's why we ask you again, who is behind the mask? Let us reference The Negro Races, a sociological study, volume 1, The Negritos, comprising the Pygmies, Bushmen, and Hottentots of Central and South Africa. The Negritians, comprising the Yolof, Mandingos, Hausas, Ashantis, Dahomeyes, etc. of the Sudan, and the Tibus of the Sahara Desert, and the Felatas of Central Sudan, by Jerome Dowd and it was published 1907 and there we see the following the Africans have been subjected to a line of treatment exactly opposite to that which every race must undergo in its progress from savagery to civilization so our interest is the fact that they have been subjected to something opposite First, the missionary arrives upon the scene and attempts to change the psychological life of the people by imparting literary education and cramming the Negro brain with the highly abstract doctrines and philosophy of Christianity, but leaving his industrial life untouched. Next come the colonial officials with their brass buttons, red trousers and other grill girls who make some effort to maintain peace and protect commerce but upset native institutions and issue formal proclamations of emancipation to a people who have not learned the first principle of economic independence and who interpret the proclamation to mean that no one need work if he does not wish to. So again we ask you, who is behind the mask? So please pause this video and read this entire page yourself. But our interest is where it says, as a result of contact with the Negro, the character and institutions of the Falatas, that's the Fulanese, seemed to receive more and more of a savage stamp. 
particularly in the direction of more merciless and cruel treatment of their subjects which is a characteristics of negro rulers referring to the Felata degeneracy lady lugard writes please remember lady lugard was the author of one of the books we referenced earlier called tropical dependency and here she writes according to this author now the judicial system of the Hausas, already founded on Mohammedan institutions and adopted in the first instance by the conquerors. Remember, the Fulani conquered the Hausas. Remember, the same woman wrote that they ruled through the Fulanis. Again, we ask you, who is behind the mask? So it goes further to say, by the conquerors, was allowed to fall into disuse. Courts continued to exist. But the Alcalis, who should have presided over them and dispensed justice according to Quranic law, irremovable from their positions as the judges of Great Britain, were either disregarded, as in some cases, by the great chiefs who held their own courts and gave decisions at their own will, or overruled by the Emir or was still subjected to the authority of the emir's favorite slaves who decreed to their enemies inhuman punishments of their own invention for the nails to be torn out with red hot fincers for the limbs to be pounded one by one in a mortar while the victims were still alive for important people who had offended to be built up alive gradually in the town walls till after a period of agony the head of the dying man was finally walled up where among the punishments well attested to have been inflicted in the decadence of the Fulani power so you see how brutal they were read it again and read it very well too now remember it was the same woman that said that people committed suicide to run away from being ruled by white people now we ask you do you see the dots and how they connect between what she wrote and the idea that the negroes committed suicide to avoid being captured as slaves which one do you think makes more sense to you so going further it says the system of taxation like the system of justice originally based in the Hausa states upon Quranic law and in the first instance adopted by the conquerors was similarly debased. In the degradation of Fulani rule, in the later half of the century, trade was practically destroyed and agriculture rendered almost impossible by the ceaseless creation of new taxes. In nearly all the country districts, the peasantry had remained pagan. To raid pagan countries for slaves was lawful according to the Quran. In the early days of their rule, the Fulani used this permission to carry out raids against the pagan centers of the southern districts. Note this very well. As their power weakened and was confined within narrower limits in the southern emirates, they were forced to abandon the process of distant raiding they began to raid and sell their own peasantry and thus completed the desolation of the country by a process which resembled the fabulous devouring of its own body by a snake so you understand how it is so it is the atrocities of this group that we are seeing through today so when they say africans sold other africans you have to look deeper it is not the same negroes selling themselves look on top of this you will see where it says political life in the cattle zone because at that time the negroes were not considered human they were considered lower than cattle which is still what the fulani believe till today and the slave master knows this and again we ask you who is behind the mask let us reference native races and their rulers sketches and studies of official life and administrative problems in nigeria by cl temple and it was published 1918 and there we see the following here the natives are very different semitic blood is no longer evident and the type approaches rather towards that of the negro but as yet they are not by any means pure negroes but rather negroid so our interest is for you to see that there is a difference between the negro and the negroid 
So Negroid obviously is the term they use to qualify the dark races. But then the pure Negro is the exact opposite of what they consider white. So you understand what the game is all about. So here we see where they put all the groups together and it says and numerous related populations such as the Calabas east of the Niger, the Edsa of the Delta divided into the Brass and other peoples. Now remember the Ejo in this case is just a lump of other people. It doesn't mean one particular group because the slave master does divide and conquer. That's why we told you to find out who is behind the mask. So it goes further to say the Ibera between the lower and middle Niger and on the Benue River and their neighbors the Igara on the left bank of the Niger and lower Benue, the Ibo of the Delta, the Lorin in the interior west of the Niger and finally the Efik on the coast extending to the Rio del Rey River which is the dividing line on the west coast between the Negritians of the Sudan and the Bantus of Middle and Southern Africa. The Yorubas present the ordinary Negro type except that they like the Ashantis and the Humans have less pronounced features and somewhat lighter colored skin than the average of the black race. Their figures are comparatively graceful and symmetrical. The Igbos have a yellow or brownish black complexion, sometimes almost white. It has been presumed that at some time they have undergone a slight barber or felata impregnation. The other divisions of the group have a strong Yoruba likeness. So please remember that this idea that the Igbos or the others had Yoruba anything is not true. The Yorubas and the Fulanis are their foot soldiers. This is a technique in conquest. They start by saying these people and these people are the same and then from there they capture them. Remember that's how the Yorubas started saying they are Ebas are Yorubas. Ebas are Yorubas and today Ebas have become Yorubas. They have now moved on. You hear them say that Ishekris are Yorubas. You have even heard the only of Ife say that Igbos are also related to Yorubas. That's their game. If you study how they did the conquest, including the Fulanese, if you hear Fulani, Hausa Fulani, you will think Fulanese and Hausa have any relationship. It's not true. The Fulanese are the slave masters to the Hausa and to the rest of what that sub-region. The slave master controls the region through them and that's why we ask you again who is behind the mask. And on the opposite side, it tells us that the Kanuris embrace a large and distinct population of Arabs, a considerable admixture of felatas and a substratum of typical Negroes with devilish black. So you see, nobody has ever seen the devil before. But you see how the slave master has been able to not only create devil, has been able to tell us what color the devil could have been. Even when nobody has ever seen the devil before. So you see how it works. The slave master is subtle. So it goes further to tell us that Negroes with devilish black skins, projecting cheekbones, flat noses and thick lips, the houses are made up of Arabs and felatas, intermixed with a preponderating Negro substratum, and upon the whole having a decidedly darker complexion than the Negroes of the coast. So you see how they are bringing and turning things around. Remember this book was being written in 1907 and that was just when the slave trade was being remodeled from what it was during the physical hunt, raid and capture to what it is today. Let us reference the dual mandate in British Tropical Africa by the Right Honorable Sir F. G. Lugard and it was published 1922 and there we see the following. These drawbacks are less manifest in the Negroid than in the pure Negro races. While the Nilotic tribes known as Sudanese and Blacks, though not intelligent, are more dependable in these respects and the Hausas approximate to them. Now again, you see the Negroid, you see the Negro. Again, we ask you, notice that he has said here that the Sudanese and Blacks are not intelligent. We ask you, do you think the slave master would have bought 
or are captured or sailed all the way from Europe or America to come and take people who are just murderers or who live on trees and cannot do anything for them. Remember, they could have also captured cattle too if there was just all they were looking for. All they used was they used the Hamitic and Negroid groups who were not very intelligent to help them capture the Negroes. A subsequent edition which I'll show you what we meant and again we ask you who is behind the mask. So here he goes further to tell us that in many cases the custom of slavery may have been learned from alien slave dealers. Slaves on the other hand whose owners were either Arabs or Fulani would be subject to either harsh or liberal treatment according to the temperament or whim of their master like the Gibeonites in the Hebrew state or the Helots of Greece. Again we ask you who is actually behind the mask. So here it says a large part of northern Nigeria had never been conquered by the Fulani and was unconquered until it submitted to the British. In that portion therefore even though the people admitted our right to deal with their lands and their lives as we should see fit, we are as a civilized nation precluded from assuming such dominion and control over the land as would interfere with the communal or private rights of the conquered people. In the other portion of the British conquered, the dominant race which was Muslim and as such recognized the Maliki law of Islam but these conquerors as the committee records are believed to have adopted to a large extent the pre-existing system of native law including that of land tenure which we may assume was based on the general principles I have described as being common to this part of Africa. So again we ask you who is actually behind the mask. So here is a very important part of this whole narrative and here Lugat tells us that the Fulani of northern Nigeria are, as I have said, more capable of rule than the indigenous races. But in proportion as we consider them an alien race, we are denying self-government to the people over whom they rule and supporting an alien caste, albeit closer and more akin to the native races than an European can be. Yet capable as they are, it requires the ceaseless vigilance of the British staff to maintain a high standard of administrative integrity and to prevent oppression of the peasantry, which is what they know well. If you doubt us, ask Nigerians, there's a man called El Zazaki. Just because he follows a different strand of Islam from theirs and is not Fulani, he's been in detention for nearly five to six years now. Over nothing, that's who the Fulani are. Over nothing, the slave master knows this. That's why we still ask you who is actually behind the mask. So it goes further to say we are dealing with the same generation and in many cases with the identical rulers who were responsible for the misrule and tyranny which we found in 1902. The subject races near the capital were then serfs and the victims of constant extortion. That's who the Fulanis are. Those dwelling at the distance were raided for slaves and could not count their women, their cattle or their crops their own. Punishments were most barbarous and included impalement, mutilation and burying alive. So you see what the Fulanese are like. They know all this. This is why no matter what happens there, they pretend not to see because they are solidly behind it. Again we challenge you who is behind the mask. This is very important if you can take or find a little time to conduct your own research or at least look for these materials and read them yourself. And here we come to the end of this edition of Who is Behind the Mask for Negroes Part 1. We thank you very much for listening and we do hope you will find time to conduct your own research. Peace.